They will be of iron will and steely muscle. In great armor shall I clad them, and with the mightiest guns will they be armed. They will be untouched by plague or disease. No sickness will blight them. First company ready. Where there is uncertainty, I shall bring light. Where there is doubt, I shall sow faith. Where there is shame, I shall point atonement. Where there is rage, I shall show its course. We are the Emperor's angels of death, not his angels of mercy. For the Emperor! We warned you of the price of your actions. Now you must pay it in full, in blood. This time, we will not be so lenient. We will exterminate you, ape. Every world, every vessel, every one of you. You think us weak, but we will be your doom, stupid monkey. Infantry Company, this is the moment of truth. You will not give a single step to the enemy. Though our tanks and artillery are mighty, it is the vast ranks of Imperial Guardsmen that shall trample the enemy to dust. Dawn of War 2, Eternal Mod, Deep Dive. How we doing lads? If you don't know, I'm a big fan of Dawn of War 2 and its expansion. I used to play the game religiously when I was younger, and please don't hurt me, but it's actually my favourite Dawn of War in the series. The game came out for me during a time where I was just low in mood, and it was always something that I could look forward to. Since doing videos on YouTube, I've been debating with myself which Dawn of War 2 Retribution mod I should cover. There's the Vengeance of the Blood Ravens mod, which changes the units and gameplay to reflect the novels and books. It also adds things from the Horus Heresy. Space Marines are one man army, and Tyranids make your FPS go to about 4 due to how many there are. There's then the Codex Edition mod, which basically adds all the units in your army's codex and more. It allows for giant battles, and it's a lot of fun. The Elite mod, which is probably the most well-known Dawn of War 2 Retribution mod, it's completely multiplayer focused on keeping the existing playstyle of the game alive, with balance changes, new units, Grey Knights as a faction, tournaments for people to play in, it's the most active community. There's many other mods as well, but I was thinking about covering those in particular as I feel they deserve their own video at some point. It seems that a lot of the modders and devs from what I can see share their assets, models and textures with each other, so it's hard to keep track of what's original to one team. In the end, I've decided to cover the Eternal mod first for now. It's one of the more newer Dawn of War 2 Retribution mods to come out, it's quite different from the original playstyle of the base game, and because it's relatively new, I hope that it gets further developed to a point where I can come back and make a second video. It's Captain Bloodflag here, bruv. Since we're gonna be learning about the Eternal mod thing, I thought it would be a Zoggin Captain idea if we learn about how Dawn of War 2 plays first. I'd be getting all moist just thinking about the mod. If you don't play this mod after the video, I'll come to your ends, shag your nan, and do you in geezer. I'll also definitely steal one of the nice hats you have. I've got to add to my collection, you see. Dawn of War 2 is different to its predecessor. Whilst the first game had you focus on base building, which allowed for forward spawn points, relocating your base, large armies, and different strategies of how to engage your opponent, Dawn of War 2 had no base building or large armies, but built on the idea of a smaller army with more intense micromanagement of abilities and units. Before you start a match, you would select a faction or race with three different heroes to choose from with different abilities. The hero's playstyle differ usually in the categories of defense, offense, support, and a few others mixed in. They were the main component for the game that allowed for each match to be a little bit different for replayability, but it wasn't a lot. Each faction would still have all the same units, other than perhaps one or two special ones the hero could spawn in, you would gain levels for the heroes and units during the match giving them better war gear, and the games consisted of fighting for power nodes and resource points to get better units with three tiers. The game is extremely fun, and definitely did gather a community of people to play it regularly, but there's no doubt people from Dawn of War 1 miss base building. So you would think merging the two together would work, but Dawn of War 3's MOBA style didn't fit into either category. Lanes forced big blobby fights with no real strategy, heroes and elite units didn't have nearly as many upgrades as they did in previous games, and the base building offered no real defensive playstyle or any playstyle to that matter. So where does the Eternal mod fit into this? The mod was co-created by Team 39, Team which consisted of the Helpless Celt and I Toaster. Like any Once again, they did have support from other teams creating this, such as the Elite mod, Vengeance of the Blood Ravens, and Codex team, providing assets and help with development. 
iToaster has been pretty vocal making extremely engaging videos talking about his work on the mod since December last year. The videos are funny and well worth a watch. And coupled with that was the fact that of course I'm balancing a full time job around developing this mod, so it is taking a little longer to get things done. I feel your pain Toaster, full time work is not fun. Talky Toaster is actually a modder for Dawn of War 3 Redux, which is a mod that attempted to shape the game into a similar playstyle of Dawn of War 1. This includes reworking Elite, making individual units feel more powerful instead of Dreadnoughts playing like a throwaway unit, oh. allowing more freedom with base building, and much more. Honestly, from the little I've played, if Dawn of War 3 launched like this, it could have been a completely different experience for many, and it might have gained a small fan base. You know, even if you did work nine years, it probably still wouldn't have been enough. Not even Gork and Mork could have saved that game. Something I do find interesting is if you go watch his Dawn of War 3 What You Should Do video, it seems he's taken it upon himself to shape the Dawn of War game he wants. This includes base building, a choice of a defendable playstyle with turrets, mines and walls, Dawn of War 2 graphics, hero units, cover that is not smegging bubbles, upgrades that are tied to squads allowing for more choice and strategy than purchasing each unit variant, and lastly, more replayability with factions than every game feeling the same. Hell, I'll get my credit card out right now. We're already five Zogan minutes into the video! I ain't go the attention spam for one of your hour-long deep dives. You get me? Okay, so what is the Eternal mod? Well, to sum it up, it's base building, sub-factions, new units, different mechanics, quality of life changes, and features. Something I must start with is the main menu screen. They changed the UI and fonts and it seems a lot cleaner. You know you're playing something different to Dawn of War 2 Vanilla and other mods, but starting with the most obvious, base building is now in the game. Of course, it's not to Dawn of War 1 scale, but it's still good. It's more in line with your games like Company of Heroes or Iron Harvest. The difference between something like this and Dawn of War 3's base building is firstly you can go for a defensible playstyle. We need to build a wall and it has to be built quickly. Secondly, there's choice where to invest for units instead of just one path for each faction. Every faction starts the game with an engineer, bone singer, or whatever the equivalent is for other factions that has the ability to make buildings. They all have different buildings they can make, but the main ones are the barracks, which is for units, the armory, which is for upgrades, and power generators. They all have different names, so for the sake of simplicity, I'll stick with that for now. Some units for your faction will be tied to your HQ, others will be tied to your barracks. When built, you get access to some instantly, and some will need to be invested in to recruit or require you to upgrade your HQ. Depending on your playstyle, enemy counterpicking, your sub-faction might influence what you need to invest in the barracks. This is something I've been trying to get used to in the Eternal mod, and I usually just end up investing in everything, which is how you get fucked. You then have the armory, which upgrades your unit's health, damage, and gives units and heroes better war gear. This is probably the most important building in the game disregarding your HQ, because deciding where to invest will greatly impact your match. In vanilla, it was quite simple. Get tier 2 and tier 3. In eternal mod, getting your standard infantry more health and damage should take higher priority than getting to tier 2 with the HQ, in my opinion. There are rare occasions where you might decide to go against this, perhaps if your teammates get into tier 2 early, or it doesn't suit your sub-faction. You could focus on getting better war gear for your hero, or you might prefer going for a vehicle strategy utilising your core infantry as chaff, with vehicles doing the main damage. The last one is the power generator. In vanilla you capture resource points and power nodes which you can add generators to. In Eternal this still is the case, however power nodes have upgrades that increase their output, and resource nodes have upgrades that increase production and defense with more health with a turret, similar to Dawn of War 1. You can build up to 6 generators at your base. This allows for a playstyle of being aggressive getting early map control or focusing on sitting back with guaranteed resources on defense. Something I have played against is players who go for a forward base build. It's really annoying to play against if you don't expect it and you won't in Dawn of War 2, so watch out for that. For other changes in the Eternal mod, vehicles have different speeds, Bane Blades move about the same speed as a pensioner on the way to Dobby's Garden Centre, whilst Chimeras and Bane Wolves are zipping around the battlefield. They also have start up and slow down speeds which makes it feel more realistic. I like this. Another change is weapons all have the same damage. What I mean by this is a plasma gun wielded by an Imperial Guardsman is the same as one wielded by a Space Marine. What makes a difference is the accuracy and fire rate. Oh no, they're shooting at us! Good thing bad guys are such terrible shots. Man, these guys are elusive. 
Guardsmen are actually really good in the game. Or I mean, Astro Minotaurum. All units move faster, which allows for faster paced matches, which is so much nicer than Vanilla's Snooze Fest. Team 39 have tried to make the Eternal mod a good PvE experience. AI will equip sergeants to squads and will attempt to base build, but teching up currently still is an issue for them. I've played against expert computers and they do get the odd tier 2 unit out, but never tier 3, so I imagine it's still a work in progress. I take that back, they seem to get tier 3 units if you give them enough time and play victory point. The Imperial Guard AI seems more consistent than the Eldars in doing this, but some games they will build turrets near victory points, pressure your base and tech up. Other times, it seems like they're stuck on tier 2 and won't do any of that. I appreciate though that this must be a hard thing to mod. Eternal also has reworked vanilla maps. This adds more points to the map, more suited to the mod's playstyle. Over the last few weeks, I've been getting my multiplayer skills back on track and been learning the Eternal mod, which has been a difficult experience. <laughs> recognized in games. I usually think of my channel as a insignificant caterpillar slowly moving along eating views that will some point evolve into a beautiful butterfly. I truly appreciate all the support I get. Sub factions. I would argue these are the best thing about the Eternal mod, combining lore and playstyle to give a unique match every time. Each of the three factions being Eldar, Guardsman and Space Marine all have three sub factions. Space Marines! They simp for that Emperor get! I hope they got first company humans as they give a proper fight! Let's start with the first company. Powerful veterans of many wars fought in the chapter's name. The first company gets priority access to improved unit types capable of dominating the battlefield. Ooh, lovely! I haven't played a lot as the Space Marines, especially the first company because everyone's been playing them in Eternal Mod, so I've always been trying to play different races for cinematic effect. From what I've learned, the first company is probably the most approachable sub-faction to start with. You don't need to focus on vehicles, just get tactical marines and get Upgrades people, upgrades! That's how we make the dough. Tactical marines are beasts in their own right. With upgrades, you can prepare them for almost any engagement. If your enemy decides to go for a vehicle strategy, just increase their speed and get melter guns out. Or stick with plasma guns for infantry, as this is rather viable until in tier 3. Early game marines are nothing short of a nightmare due to crack and bolt rounds. 
With the first company captain, I recommend getting him the Thunder Hammer, the Artificer's Armor for Speed and Energy Shield as he's always getting stuck in compared to the other leaders. The Eternal Mod still has endgame units, but I now feel there's almost a tier 3 and tier 4. All HQs do have another upgrade after tier 3, which for the Space Marines is the Heavy Armor Deployment. From what it seems, tier 3 focuses on the best infantry the roster has to offer and hero upgrades to the max, which for the first company is Terminators and upgrading the captain of course. All companies do get access to Terminators, except for the Assault ones, but I would say range is better anyway. First Company also has access to Grey Knights and Stern Guard Veterans as command abilities. Both are extremely situational, however I would say the Grey Knights are better for infantry as they can tie them up in combat, and Smite helps with AoE. I know iToaster is looking to give them a few war gear options in the future, so we will see. Stern Guard Veterans are cool, but they ain't no Malam Kaido taking on a whole Chaos Army. They can be useful if you try a different strategy with the first company, but kind of feel obsolete if you get fully upgraded marines. If you do end up requiring tier 3.5, you get access to a venerable dreadnought, which is rather cheap compared to terminators and other high-end units, a land raider redeemer, and a predator destructor, which you can upgrade its bolters with a las cannon. The first company is a great sub-faction for beginners, and I would love to see blade guard veterans added, but I feel the other sub-factions need more currently. The fifth company insinuates that the battle commencing requires armoured deployment. Whilst in lore, as far as I'm aware, it isn't armoured specific, the mod it is. You can go for any playstyle with the sub-factions, but I'll tell you about a risky one I take with the fifth company. Starting off, I wouldn't bother with tactical marines unless you're really trying to mind game your opponent. Get scouts instead as they're cheaper and faster to capture resource posts to get things running. You're not going for heavy map control here, you're going to go for an early dreadnought build. Use your requisition on scouts and to build generators which give 25 power when built instantly. It used to be 50 power per generator which was kind of broken, but it still does allow for a quick tier 2 and it is more viable in team games as your teammate can cover you whilst you get there. You then have the choice between an Ironclad or Hellfire Dreadnought. Ironclads are your tanks. If your opposition has got cocky with turrets, just get one of these lads out to gain ground and tank whilst your scouts deal damage. You may lose map control in the early game, but your opponent will not expect this quick rush. The Ironclad also comes equipped with a melter gun, so it's a great counter to buildings, vehicles and anti-tank infantry with its health. If your opponent does counter you hard with anti-tank infantry, get the power range sanctions technology and equip the hurricane bolter. If you do have the resources, you can go for the Hellfire Dreadnought. Very good against infantry, with more range, but does have less health than the Ironclad. If your opponent comes at you with vehicles, get the Laz Cannon upgrade. Both Dreadnoughts cover each other's weaknesses, so pay attention to which one you need. With investing a lot in the Dreadnoughts, it's vital you keep them alive. It's one of the key reasons you need to utilise your Forge Master. These guys can repair three times faster than Scouts, which means you want them right next to your Dreadnoughts Bunda, giving him the business. Tier 3 does feel kind of weak in the 5th company, as you want to avoid Terminators so you can repair vehicles, but they're all locked behind the Heavy Armoured deployment, so maybe make the Predator available at Tier 3. The Forge Master in the early game can be strong with his Mastercrafted Bolt Gun, but he's also decent in melee as well. Get him the Omnisire Power Axe and the Signum Armor, and he's pretty much a decent fighter and support unit for vehicles. If you do go for Tier 3.5, Fellblade goes Nothing more needs to be said, it's your win button. You can get powerful units out quite fast with the Communications Array, as you can get power so easily with 125 per 100 command. I think a nerf is needed for this, or at least a cooldown on spamming it. I'm not very good at the reserve company, it kind of feels like the Space Marines equivalent of the Eldar sub-faction, which is hit and run tactics. You could play it safe and go for a similar tactic of the first company where you spam assault marines and get upgrades. Uh, do you know what this reminds me of? Let's see how many resources the new factories are producing. <sighs> wow, what a harvest! Upgrade all Vanguard veterans to the highest level. Let's play the Eternal mod. Idiots in the Eternal mod will waste resources, they'll fight without even an armory, and the opposite player is going to shag your mum due to how bad you are. But God Emperor Chad's in the Eternal mod, they'll research new technology, even if it's against 40k lore, they'll get more resources, and they'll fight the enemy on their terms. Oh no, the enemy is attacking my base, kill me now. Download for free. I'm a fully grown adult, what am I doing with my life? Easy peasy. One of the unique units you start with in the reserve company is the Assault Scout Squad, which can be upgraded with flamers and chainsaws. At first I thought this unit was weak, 
but if you get the infiltration training early on, you've got a great melee unit that can almost get into combat before being noticed. It definitely sells the hit and run tactics. The reserve company is also the only company that can build tarantula sentry guns, which are good at holding points and fighting around to fall back to if needed. They can be upgraded with more health as well, allowing them to be more viable in the later game. Early game, the captain can have the heavy bolter, which he can set up instantly. This can be a real game changer and is highly worth investing in. For tier 2, vehicles you get the Dreadnought and Razorback, which is good at transporting units. You also get the Damocles Command Rhino, which I love to see. It reduces the fog of war around you so you can see more, but it can't move whilst doing this. I would love for the Damocles to have a bit more utility, with perhaps a small orbital it can cool down, but I understand its use in the company, which we will get to. I do wish there was a little bit more for infantry in tier 2 in the reserve company. You could reuse the scout models with sniper rifles and make a 3 man squad of eliminators with more range and damage, but I understand not wanting Primaris. Tough shit, firstborn are dead. Tier 3 you can go for terminators of course, but you do have access to the best melee unit in the game being the vanguard veteran squad. You could make the argument for them being in the first company, but this gives the reserve company something. If you don't choose that, you can go for the Whirlwind at tier 3, pair it up with a Damocles and it's got great range. Tier 3.5 is a land raider with las cannons, pretty normal. I kind of wonder now how long it will be until land raiders get retired. There is one more unit that every sub-faction has that is worth mentioning. You have Captain Diomedes. Command, I am on the move. All shall yield or fall before us. It is the Bane Blade! I'm kind of curious actually how much is going to come out of this. Oh my god! <laughs> the upgrade is actually called a shipment of a hundred Bane Blades. Brilliant. The pansies fancy a fight. Their pointy sticks always make good stabbers. I would like an elder waifu though. The Eldar sub factions are based on the different pathways they can take, which is basically the result of their only fans <sighs> going bust after Smash and having to get proper careers. The one unique thing about the Eldar faction in Eternal mod is they have shields. I know Kelt and Toaster watching from their videos had problems coding this, but in the end they decided to have it where the shields take energy away. Like Dawn of War 3, I get why there are shields, as it encourages hit and run tactics. The Eldar also have another important building, unlike the other factions dedicated to making vehicles. From this you can get a war walker out, similar to the Sentinel, I miss these units on tabletop. Watch out for the early spam rush builds of these. So let's start with the Path of the Warrior, led by an Autark Exodite, which is way cooler than a Warp Spider like Vanilla. This should honestly be a model that GW makes. Needs a Dragon Dinosaur mount though. This sub-faction is the Aggressor of the Eldar. You actually get two unique starting units from the Storm Guardian Squad, opposed to the Guardian Defender Squad, and Striking Scorpions. Both are great early game melee units. Once again, upgraded infantry isn't a bad way to go, which you can do via the vehicle building, but you will lack anti-tank with this. If your opponent does have a focus on infantry, another really strong strategy with the warrior path is going straight to tier 2 and getting the fucking swooping hawk squad. I'm joking! Stop! 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 They annihilate infantry, move super fast, and if your enemy doesn't counter, good luck. For vehicles, the cool answer is wraith blades, but you will need to get ghost axe and force shield upgrades to make them viable. These guys were broken in the mod for a brief time as no one knew how to deal with them, but they now count as heavy infantry. Or you could just play it safe with the falcon with a bright light. You do get Warlocks now as a unit opposed to being a hero, similar to Space Marine Librarians, but they are situational with some cool tricks with support and disrupt abilities. Tier 3, you should get your Exodite the Blade of Exodite Ancients and the Runic Armor, making him a powerhouse, or a Wraith Lord which are nuts due to having a shield now so they can stay in combat way longer. Tier 3.5 or the Wrath of Val, which is like the Eldar's equivalent of We've Had Enough Now, is an Avatar of Cain. The Warrior Path is probably the easier Eldar sub-faction to pick up, but I do prefer the others' playstyles, unless I'm going for an early rush build with this. I like the Path of the Outcast, both playstyle and lore. It's a mix of your sneaky beaky like and... Corsair. You don't have much staying power compared to the other sub-factions. Your main advantage is speed and range. Like Vanilla, you can build webway gates with all the sub-factions, but the outcasts rely on it. 
you can get upgrades that cloak the webway gates and units, and you should get these as you tear up. I believe the Outcasts have access to the best starting unit for the Eldar being the Corsair Squad. They have more range, damage and upgrades for every scenario. Since playing more of the Eternal mod, I've learned that factions really do have different playstyles against different factions. Corsairs are rather good against Guardsmen with Flamers and Fusions, but against Space Marines you will struggle. You have a better chance of fighting if you recruit the Harlequins or take War Walkers with the Corsair, as melee or light vehicles will throw them off a bit. If you do get to Tier 2, War Walkers upgraded with Heavy Scouting is probably the way to go against Marines, giving more health and shield. Or if you do have Infantry, a Firestorm for support, but the Outcast is hard to play. Pathfinders at tier 2 are terrible in my opinion, unless you actually get them the upgrade, maybe I'm just bad. Tier 3, they don't really have much different to the other two sub-factions, since Dark Reapers and Fire Dragons, every sub-faction can get those, and the Fire Prism is in the path of the Seer as well. The only other unique unit is in tier 3.5, being the Scorpion for anti-vehicles, which is pretty cool. I think Shadow Seers are missing or bugged out because I can't seem to find them. The Path of the Outcast, in my opinion, is the weakest Eldar sub-faction. If you win with this, you're doing a good job. Against Guard, it does feel more balanced, but Space Marines, good luck. I think giving the Ranger Exarch a bit more damage or a long rifle as a tier 1 upgrade and then making the Pathfinders do a bit more damage could go a long way. I have noticed the map makes a difference with this sub-faction and I have found more success in a team game. Probably because I'm getting carried. <coughs> anyway, Path of the Seer. Led by Aphasia, this sub-faction plays most similar to Vanilla but it does have some unique units in it. Every sub-faction does have Dire Avengers and I highly recommend taking them for this path. Dire Avengers are not too expensive and can keep up with the power curve with upgrades. You can get laser blasters for range, flamers and fusion guns as well. Against Space Marines, chuck them in the bin. You're going to want to lean into Banshees and platform teams much more. You honestly have to deny their range damage by tying them up in melee or suppressing them. Once they get Assault Marines, things get a little bit more tricky. Banshees can win those fights if you keep up in the health and damage upgrades, but you've got to watch out for the fast Dreadnought builds that the AI throwed at me. They really do pick their times to be good. Support platform teams are sub-faction specific and they can be upgraded with Bright Lances and D Cannons. Tier 2 for Path of the Seer isn't much different to the other sub-factions, but Tier 3 they get a Wraith Seer opposed to a Wraith Lord, and this is awesome. It has access to psychic abilities and can be upgraded with D cannons. These guys are a great counter to Space Marines and especially Terminators. The real counter though is at Tier 3.5 and it's the Type 2 Cobra. This thing also has a distortion cannon which basically shoots black holes. Who's ever driving the grav tank definitely needs an allegation of drink driving against them. What seems to be the officer process? Overall, I do like the Eldar, but they are the least consistent sub-faction in games, where sometimes you feel like your race is going even more extinct than the Lord of Picks, and other times they live up to the power faction of Psychers and Trickery. Definitely the hardest to play. Not even your Ned can save them now. There's just quite a lot to invest in compared to other factions with Cloaking the Webway Gate, Battle Equipment Shields, Fleeting Foot, Health, Damage, Scout, Vehicle and Hero upgrades, Whilst I love the choice, perhaps make some of it a little cheaper, but that's just my opinion. I'm also pretty sure there's a bug with the Guardian Defender Squad where they can't retreat when emboldened, but that might be intentional. The only proper human was Yerick. Gaz has given me and the boys a job to go get that red face kit for killing him. The guard, in my opinion, does feel the most balanced. This is including computer and players. Militarum Tempestus honestly makes me want to buy an Imperial Guard Start Collecting Box and paint the Penal Legion. But there's only one way to describe this sub-faction. There are always casualties in war, gentlemen. Otherwise it wouldn't be war. It'd just be a rather nasty argument with lots of pushing and shoving. If it isn't clear, this sub-faction has a focus around the Inquisition's units, starting with Stormtroopers. Pretty versatile, these guys are not too bad out the gate. They have their standard upgrades for Manila, including Infiltration as well, but also a few new ones being a Medic, a Tempesta, increasing health and regen. A support kit which allows you to revive even heroes, so pretty powerful, and they can also repair. Now, it wouldn't be a true Inquisition sub-faction if you couldn't sacrifice humans in the name of the Emperor which is where point-blank dropping a Penal Legion squad comes in. More enjoyable than Darktide. You know, it's true. The Penal Legion ain't good for anything other than tying up units in melee or capturing resource points, which is useful, but they are the equivalent of Skaven Slaves. Against the Eldar and Eternal, Stormtroopers are brilliant and you can stick with them for Tier 1. 
Space Marines, you need the Scout Sentinels and Penal Legion squads, they're just much better picks in general for that matchup. Do watch out for Scout builds though, as Stormtroopers with Infiltration can help with that. If you do get to Tier 2, don't bother with the Katachan Jungle Fighters, they aren't nearly the Rambos they should be, and get folded by most other Tier 2 units. I just haven't found their niche yet. You are far better going with a Chimera if you've taken Stormtroopers or a Bane Wolf if you're going up against infantry. Tier 3, you get access to Borgrins, which are sub-faction specific, giving me Dark Tide vibes, but they get tossed around more than a dog with a chew toy. Explosions and suppression really prevent this unit from popping off, and with shields, you would expect that to relieve some of it. They also don't do a lot of damage if your enemy has health upgrades, but they are best used for stunning, and I would only recommend having one of these. Tier 3.5 or full scale war brings out the Stormblade. Being the cousin of the Baneblade, it's devastating as an endgame unit, and it's fun to watch Marines disintegrate. <laughs> The other 3.5 unit is a destroyer which has more health than a Lehman Russ and is more designed for anti-vehicle. The Inquisitor is relatively the same but does get some stormtroopers to help her in melee. Overall, the Militarum Tempestus has a focus around elite guard units that allows for a mix of different playstyles and it's fun playing the Inquisition. Moving on to the infantry company, they have a saying. The infantry company is fun, sending hordes of guardsmen to their death makes me feel like a true commissar, but the sub-faction is no walkover to play, your macro needs to be on point, mixing together a wide range of abilities and counters. To no surprise, you start with the standard guardsmen squad, but they are super versatile in the mod. Against space marines you can take grenade launchers that provide knockback and range, Eldar you can take the vanilla flamethrowers and plasma guns, however, there's also fixed bayonets. This provides more melee damage and a bayonet charge ability. There's just nothing more satisfying in this mod than seeing a typical guardsman charge a space marine with a toothpick and knocking him over. Ideally you want a mix of guard units, some with grenade launchers, plasma guns and some with bayonets for melee. Unlike other infantry focused sub-factions, the way to go is upgrades. Tier 2 for infantry, you get a special weapons squad, and these guys are more beefier guardsmen that can be upgraded with many different things, being sniper rifles, melter guns, even power swords for melee, which is awesome. You can then pair this unit up with a commissar, which is no longer a hero, but a unit you can recruit with a squad of sergeants at his disposal. Like vanilla, the commissar has many AoE buffs for guardsmen to increase their damage, but he's also great in melee and a range fighter. Whilst vehicles are still options you can pick in this sub-faction, they aren't counters or viable units on their own, they're purely there to allow your infantry to succeed more. Chimeras are still a valid pick for the infantry, but you might be better getting the seal of the company and getting a command Chimera. It can't carry any units, but it can deploy a guardsman squad anywhere and can be upgraded with an auto cannon. If you need more men on the front line, it's your pick. The other unit is a Hellhound which uses a heavy flamer to burn victims, similar to the Bane Wolf. At tier 3 you get a Lehman Rust Demolisher, which is a lovely addition to the roster. It's not designed to take out heavy infantry or a vehicle killer, it's more for clearing out defences allowing for your infantry to push. It can be upgraded with a Gatling Cannon for more DACA, but if you come across vehicles, it won't do anything. This is where the infantry is key in this sub-faction, as you will need them to overcome vehicles in most scenarios. But the best tier 3 infantry unit which is a must pick in the infantry company is Kasakin. These guys live up to the hype of the law in the mod, and they are no walkover. Upgradable with more health and speed, they outright demolish other units in a range fight. You then have their counterpart being Ogrins with Ripper guns from vanilla. They can be upgraded with bayonets for more melee damage, and they're pretty good against vehicles. Tier 3.5, you get a Stormlord with a twin Vulcan cannon. It denies enemy infantry even shooting with all its hail of bullets knocking them back. And unlike the Bane Blade, it can transport units, reinforce them, so it's kind of similar to the Space Marine Land Raider. Ideally the final unit you want when pushing for the win. The infantry company is a pleasure to play. Can be quite micro intensive but if you use infantry with upgrades to deal with most things and use the vehicles as punching bags and defence breakers, you will succeed. The opposite could be said for the armoured company. Infantry here isn't your backbone but your shield and vehicles are your spear. Once again, this sub-faction starts with guardsmen squads, but I highly recommend calling down conscripts to catch a resource post faster. You then should get scout sentinels out, as they will be part of your strategy. Opposite to the infantry company, I wouldn't bother with upgrades. Once you get to tier 2, this is where this sub-faction starts to pop off. 
You have a choice between an Assault Chimera which has an auto cannon and can shoot its heavy bolters without needing infantry, but I would advise to spam Armoured Sentinels. Subfaction specific, these guys have more health and start armed with a flamethrower which is great against infantry. I would then advise investing in the Engine Seer Quarters which increases armoured upgrades more on vehicles and allows for the last cannon on the Sentinel. You then have a fast infantry and vehicle killer for a cheap price. You then work this unit in with conscripts and guardsmen to type counters in melee and it's a strong strategy. For your general, you need to recruit a Watchmaster for him. This gives him the ability to repair and it's a must in the sub-faction. The Devil Dog is also a tier 2 unit, quite tricky to use as it's a good counter against Dreadnoughts but the Eldar it loses in a ranged fight against the Falcon. This sub-faction has nothing special for infantry which is not surprising. For tier 3 you get the standard Lehman Russ but a cool strategy is to go for a seal of the regiment and call down a command Lehman Russ. Pop a commissar in and you gain more range, firepower and sight which is a nice little addition. The other tier 3 unit is a Thunderer. Not as good as the Lehman Rush Demolisher as it can't turn and it has to face where it's firing but it is cheaper. The last is the Bane Blade for 3.5 which you know from vanilla. The Armoured Company changes up the play style of the guard in a unique way by managing vehicle upgrades and weapons to counter the enemy as your infantry will struggle but you can mind game once again. And that's one thing that I love about this mod. All of my suggestions are just what I find works and you can take any strategy. With balance coming in every update, you never stay on the same strategy. Time to show the boys how to download the mod. If it isn't clear, you need Dawn of War 2 Retribution purchased and downloaded as the mod only works with that. Go to the Eternal Mod website, click files and download the latest version. Once you've downloaded the mod, place it somewhere you will remember. I placed mine in my Dawn of War 2 folder, but it doesn't really matter as far as I'm aware. Extract the files here and click on the installer. Click next and I highly recommend you read the license agreement. It's a mod. Did you really expect some massive multi-page legal document with hidden text saying we earned the right to your second born child? We all know the first is your favorite. We aren't that evil. And to garnish 69% of your paycheck for all of eternal tie. Cough Nintendo. Cough. If you scroll down further, for some reason they've posted the B-movie script <laughs> for just no reason. You like heresy. It seems to be a common theme of Toaster and Kelp replacing random text in Eternal with some weird broccoli fetish. Do make sure you click agree and not fuck you, then direct the installer to your Dawn of War 2 retribution folder. It will default to your C drive, but mine's in the E, so do make sure you change it if you need to. Let that install and then press next. The last part is going to your game in Steam, properties, go to general, launch options and put the code dash mod name space eternal and you should be good. It's not too difficult to install compared to other mods and if you need help the discord is rather active with nice people. I Captain Blood Flag claim this mod as extremely orky, plenty of fight and looting and shooting. You all should give it a go. But alas, the video must come to an end. Almost brings a tear to my bright green cheek. Mm. Okay, I've had enough of the AI voice myself now. Coming to a conclusion, Toaster and Kelt should be proud of what they have created so far. It's an extremely unique Dawn of War 2 Retribution mod that doesn't just add cool new units, but with base building and tech trees, it's a completely different experience. I'm excited to see what they have next, as I believe it is chaos with the pictures they have teased, but I probably won't make another video on the mod for a while. As for my next video, I have been tempted to do a review on the new Chaos Gate DLC, or the Battle Sector DLC, or make a review on Realms of Ruin when it comes out in November, but I've been putting off the deep dives for a while, and especially one for a few years, which I think I'm finally ready to tackle, which will hopefully be a cool surprise for you guys. Thank you to the Patreons, once again, I truly appreciate your support. However, I am suspending my account going forward. I just feel guilty taking money without giving anything back to you guys, and I want a new way that people can support me, but you get something in return. So that's what I'm looking into currently. Thanks again for watching my video. I truly appreciate it. Take care and look after yourselves.